Well, good afternoon. Welcome to the Nancy Lee and Perry R. Bass Performance Hall. The hall is relatively young. It opened in May of 1998. So it was built new. It's not a refurbished hall. It was built from scratch on this downtown city block here in Fort Worth. Uh, it took 35 months to build. The hall has some real interesting history to it relative to, to how it was financed. It's, one of, it's a public place, but it's entirely financed with private funding. There's no public funding in Bass Performance Hall. It was all uh, funded by donations from over 6,000 individuals, foundations and corporations that gave money for the hall. Uh, fundraising was very successful. Uh, the goal when they started fundraising in 1994 was to raise $60 million and they actually raised $73 million to build the hall itself. The hall didn't cost that much money. We spent roughly $70 million. So there was some funding left over which has gone to support the children's education programs that we produce here in the hall through the school year, Monday through Friday in the mornings. The architect for the hall is David Schwartz. David Schwartz has offices in Washington, D.C. and has done a tremendous amount of work in the Fort Worth, Dallas area. Not only Bass Hall, but also other venues like the American Airlines Arena in Dallas, Cook's Children's Hospital here in Fort Worth, Sundance West Apartments, Tarrant County Courthouse Editions, and those sorts of things. So David Schwartz is your architect. Lindbeck Construction Company, a local construction company, actually built the hall. We a lot of times have people say, why is it named after Nancy Lee and Perry R. Bass? Two very good reasons for that. This downtown city block was owned by Nancy Lee and Perry R. Bass, and they basically gave it away to a nonprofit corporation called Performing Arts Fort Worth that owns and operates the hall. They also gave $10 million to help build and maintain the hall. So for those two very good reasons, uh, Bass Performance Hall carries their name. Plus the fact that the Bass family itself has been very, very uh, prominent in the revitalization of Fort Worth downtown. A lot of the rejuvenation you see in the Sundance Square area is really due to the, the impetus provided by the Bass family and what they have done for the Fort Worth area. They've been, and they've, in their ability to involve the rest of the community in these projects. We're in the East Portal right now, and I'll point out the fact that Back in the 1860s, Fort Worth was laid out in a grid network, the downtown grid network, and each block of downtown is exactly one acre in dimension. So we sit on exactly one acre of land surrounded by four busy streets, Calhoun, 4th, Commerce, and 5th Street. As a result of that, we have that footprint, a one acre footprint, so we as a hall tend to go below and higher. We tend to go vertically. So we go three stories below the ground, we go ten stories above the ground, and we sit on this one acre, one acre block. So since we are confined that way, David Schwartz, the architect, decided to build two major entranceways to the hall. I'm standing in the east portal. We have the mirror image of entranceway over in the west portal. The artwork is what really distinguishes the east portal from the west portal. All the paintings in the hall were done by twin brothers from Fort Worth, Scott and Stuart Gentling. Not the Gatling brothers, but the Gentling brothers. And they did the art directly onto the surfaces of the ceilings here, like in the West Portal, in the high dome, which is about 80 feet above your head. They worked from platforms, just like Michelangelo did the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican in Rome. So the art is done directly on the surfaces themselves. And in the east portal where we are now, you'll see we have the morning sky. So the east portal, we have the sunrise sky. And just I'll just mention the west portal is obviously going to be the afternoon sky, the sunset sky. But this is a morning sky in the east portal. And the vine that is painted, the plant that's painted around the portal, the dome itself, is a Texas red bay laurel leaf. The theme of this portal in the, in the minds of the Gentling brothers was the Greek god Apollo. Apollo, who is the god of the sun, he's the god of prose and poetry and harmony and logic, the nice quiet things 
of the world, man's nature, the quiet man's nature. So this was the quiet side of the house. Uh, the west side is the wild side. We'll talk about that later when we go over there. But this is a quiet side of the house. The Greek god Apollo is the theme. And the Texas red bay laurel leaf ties into that because Apollo had an earthling girlfriend and he got mad at her and he turned Daphne, was her name, he turned Daphne into a laurel tree to punish her. And every spring when she would put out her leaves, he would strip the leaves off the branches of the tree and he'd weave them into the victor's crowns that the Greeks used to crown the winners of their Olympic Games. And you'll see that being crowned by the laurel-y, feathery type motif, you'll see that in other places in the hall also. So this is your Apollo side, your quiet side. It does relate to what we do here in the hall because uh, it relates to the type of music that we do. This is a quiet side. This, this is your Barber, Debussy type of the hall, the side, those sorts of composers, the quiet guys. The wild guys reside in the West. So we do have that uh, feature. That, that's the, the theme of this particular uh, portal. We'll notice that we're standing on a very nice Italian marble floor. Uh, what's unique about it, a couple of things. First of all, is a, it's called a, a peach blossom marble, Fior de Pesco, because it has this nice peachy colored streaks running through it. And it comes from a quarry about 80 miles south of Rome. What's unique about it is the fact that it's carved in a spiral pattern that's of Greek origin. So we have an Italian marble carved in a Greek pattern. And what's unique about the pattern is the fact it's a spiral pattern that expands as it goes outward from the apex where I'm standing right here. So that each piece of marble is different. Each piece of marble as it expands outward grows in size. The reason it's important is because the Greeks realized that that particular, this spiral pattern that you see here in the marble, they had observed in nature in many places. Of particular interest since you're in Texas, if you go and find a sunflower somewhere, look at the pattern in the sunflower seeds. The pattern in the sunflower seeds is this exact spiral pattern. Uh, if at night, if it's a big night and the stars are bright and deep in the heart of Texas and you look up in the sky, if you can see the Milky Way galaxy, notice the spiral of the Milky Way galaxy. It's the same, same spiral. It appears in the shell of some seashells, in particular the chambered nautilus seashell. The spiral pattern exists there, the same identical thing. And it's related to what the Greeks in particular called the golden rectangle. The golden rectangle is a shape in which in the 500 BC time frame, the Greeks built all their temples, like the Parthenon on the Acropolis, is built in the shape of a golden rectangle. But the Greeks were really impressed by this. They called it the divine proportion, the golden ratio, the divine proportion, because it was visually beautiful to the human eye. So wherever you go, if you go to the Kimball Museum or somewhere, you're gonna see paintings that you can relate to this golden rectangle feature in the size, roughly eight by five. But it's, it's important to us because not only is it geometrically beautiful, it's the basis for our eight note musical octave. So the geometry that we see here de derived from architecture also defines how we hear our music. So what you see out here built into the hall relates to what we do in the hall. And we still see it everywhere in art, not just at Bass Hall, but you'll see this in architecture. Uh, our sister building across the street, we have another part of the Bass Hall complex, it's the Maddox Muse Center across Calhoun Street. It has two small halls in it, each seat about 300 people. The Van Cliburn Recital Hall, the McDavid Rehearsal Studio on the other end, on the south end. There's a tunnel under Calhoun Street that connects the two. Whereas our main hall here seats of over 2,000 people, we have the two smaller halls there. But that building, in this building, uh, will we'll show you lots of features of, of uh, the golden rectangle, all the way through the architecture of the building. Which I should mention out here, in the outside areas of the building, this, this uh, lobby area of the building, very 20th century in style. 
very much Frank Lloyd Wright, very geometric. When we go inside the audience chamber itself, you'll see that that's very 19th century. So this is, called, is a mix of architectural styles. This is called a Beaux-Arts Revival style. The inside is called a Vienna Successionist. And as uh, you might have noticed out here, everything's very silvery. When you go inside, you'll see everything's very golden. So we've got a mix of architectural features here. The only thing that's not 20th century out here in the lobby area are up on the, on the stairways on either side, there are two tall pillared columns, lights, that are called torchiers. Those are old, and those are very geometric in shape and really inspired a lot of the geometric figures that we see out here in the lobby itself. The facade here is a French limestone. Uh, it's called Rose Lisseron limestone and comes from a quarry south of Paris in the Pyrenees Mountains. What's important about it is that the color coordination between the rose, Lisseron limestone, and the peach blossom marble is perfect. Whoever was selecting the decorative features knew quarries, they knew where rocks existed that would look beautiful in this type of setting. So that's where this came from. The other neat thing about this particular pattern, this was originally going to be square cut, just a square cut floor. The Italian owner of the quarry, whose name was Paolo Marzotto, he's a count, he came here and visited the hall. He saw this pattern in the audience chamber itself, and I'll be pointing that out to you. And he told his workmen he wanted to recreate this pattern in, the, in these semicircular portals. And they said, oh no, it's going to be too much, it's going to cost too much, it's going to take too long. And that was his, his, one of, it was his gift to the hall. He said, no, you're going to do it. So they took the extra months and they did the carving and it was at his expense. And he was so impressed with it, when the hall opened in May of 1998, he invited his wife, the Countess, to come to the grand opening so she could see what he did. So that was one of the nice features of the hall. We're walking now from the east portal across the, the grand lobby headed to the west side of the hall. And as we pass here, this is the major donor board I mentioned that the hall was entirely built with private funding. Over 6,000 individuals gave money for the hall. But in particular, the, this board lists the names of the people that gave at least $10,000 as part of the fundraising activity. In the center of the board, we have these really beautiful angels that have been etched into the glass here. Uh, interestingly enough, they're etched into the glass from the back so the, the artist had to be very uh, talented to be able to make it look like a real angel on the front when uh, uh, he's actually doing the etching uh, from, from the back on the glass. But they're the first look we have of the angels here. These look like the big Court of a Cream limestone angels on the facade. Even I have angel feather in my jacket, which proves that I'm an angel too. But you'll see angels throughout the hall. The largest contribution that was given to Bass Hall was from the Sid Richardson Foundation. That was an $18 million donation. And then the Burnett Foundation, also in Fort Worth, both of these foundations are located in Fort Worth. The Burnett Foundation was another $10 million donation. Now, uh, Burnett Foundation, by, by the way, if you've been to Santa Fe, New Mexico lately, if you've been to the George O'Keefe Museum in Santa Fe, that museum was entirely funded also by the Burnett Foundation here in Fort Worth. In the list of people uh, that we have at the top of the board here, you'll notice Nancy Lee and Perry R. Bass. Of course, I've already mentioned that they gave this, this land to Performing Arts Fort Worth, a nonprofit, and they also gave a $10 million donation. And then you have the four Bass sons, the four brothers, uh, also very uh, highly involved in support of the arts in the Fort Worth area and, and of course in particular Nancy Lee and Perry are Bass Performance Hall. As we go across the Grand Lobby you'll notice in the ceiling that we have a, a beautiful painting by Scott and Stuart Gentling which depicts a walk along the Trinity River in the springtime with the oaks, the cottonwoods, the pecan trees that flourish here and then the Trinity River being our local river by the way between Fort Worth and Dallas and then th going through the trees, you'll notice that you have a number of birds flying around, various types of Texas birds. 
Uh, they're important. The Gentlings made their reputation painting birds of Texas in large folio edition like John James Audubon did Birds of the United States. But these are birds of Texas and there's some 20 different species flying around up there. Some in pairs. Uh, you'll notice cardinals and scissor tails and mockingbirds and, and others that are flying around there. Uh, also here in the lobby, uh, notice on either side of us we have these very large mirror devices. Now as you know downtown can get very windy so these are wonderful things that the ladies come in their hair needs to be combed they can have a nice chance to comb their hair. These are really closed circuit television screens and what they do at each major entrance way to the hall we have a closed circuit television screen. The purpose of those is to enable people who are coming to a performance that have, but may have arrived late we have very strict rules about when we can seat people due to disruption to the performers or the audience already seated. If they come late, they can be staying in the lobby area and they can see and hear what's happening on the stage itself and then be seated when there's a break in the performance and the ushers can take them in and show them to their proper seats. So this is one of the nice high-tech devices. This being a new hall, we have lots of innovative uh, technical devices that enhance the your ability to see the performance and that's what these are these are for these are uh, in all the major entrance ways to the hall as we continue to walk along the, across the grand lobby here we come to this statue uh, this is a statue of the Roman goddess Diana the Greeks called her Artemis goddess of the hunt for the primary thing you might remember about Diana and this statue is a gift to the Bass Performance Hall from the Eamon Carter Museum of Western Art here in Fort Worth. Uh, the statue itself is a, uh, modeled by a gentleman named Augustus St. Gaudens, who was very prominent in this country in the 1880s and 1890s as the designer of American gold coinage. So if you happen to have any American gold coinage from that time frame, it was done by Augustus St. Gaudens. This particular statue is not the original of the Diana. The original of the Diana was three times as tall as this one. It was 17 feet tall. This one's about seven feet tall. And it stood on the top of a tower at Madison Square Garden in New York City. A tower that by itself was 300 feet tall, amazingly. And it was used as a beacon where people could find Madison Square Garden. And it moved like a weather vane. It moved in the wind like a weather vane and enabled people to find Madison Square Garden at the time when they first start, were starting to build skyscrapers on the island of Manhattan. But this is a gift to us. In honor of Bayard Friedman, by the way, a former mayor of Fort Worth, it was a gift made to Bass Performance Hall by the Eamon Carter Museum. We've crossed the Grand Lobby now and we are in the West Portal which geometrically you'll notice is a, is a mirror image of what we, where we were in the East Portal. It's the same, same uh, concept of design and the marble and all as we saw in the East Portal. What's different over here is the artwork. Here we have the western sky, the sunset sky in the high dome. The tornadoes are brewing, the thunderstorms are brewing, and around the high dome we have painted the Texas Mustang grape, a very aggressive plant. So like I mentioned over there, I alluded to, this is the wild side of the house. This is the thunderstorm side, the, the uh, aggressive plant side. And this, the patron here, the uh, uh, inspiration for this side was a Greek god Dionysus. The Romans called him Bacchus. Bacchus liked to drink wine, therefore we have the Mustang grape to provide the wine it ties in the music world to the more uh, of the wild composers like Bartok and Stravinsky, uh, Wagner, those composers. So this is our, our wild side in terms of the music world. Uh, there's one unique feature in the painting itself, uh, the western sky, and it's in a little blue teardrop that is toward the edge of the painting itself. And it looks like a comet, and indeed it is. It is a hale bop comet. And the reason it's in the painting is because when the Gentlings are doing this particular art, it's around 1997 during the course of the building 
uh, of the bass hall itself. And at that time, the hale -Bopp Comet was clearly visible in our western sky here in Fort Worth, about 20 degrees above the horizon every afternoon. You could go out and you could see the hale -Bopp sitting there, very, very clear to the naked eye. So this is a reminder to us of when this artwork was done. It was when the hale -Bopp Comet was here around 1997. So here we are in the concert hall itself. Uh, we've come from the lobby area into the uh, main concert hall for Bass Performance Hall. This particular chamber seats in excess of 2,000 people, depending upon the configuration of the orchestra pit. But one thing I want you to notice when you come into the hall, and I just shut up for on purpose there. I want you to notice how quiet it is when we come into the hall. There are very good reasons for that. In the audience chamber, we have an ambient noise level of about 13 decibels, which is in the lobby areas itself where we just were, it's about 60 decibels. So it's a huge differential between the noise level. And the reason for that in the concert hall itself is that all the heavy equipment utilized to to uh, operate the hall, like the air conditioners, 375 ton air conditioner systems, your electrical, all your systems that are used to operate that might make humming noises or vibration noises or noises of any kind, they are located external to the hall and they are either under Calhoun Street in the tunnel that we have under Calhoun Street out here or across Calhoun Street in the Maddox Muse building that's on the other side of Calhoun. So there's no heavy equipment in the hall here to create any uh, noise of, of any kind. The other thing they did, I mentioned earlier that we went three stories below the ground and 10 stories above the ground. Below the ground here, remember we're surrounded by four busy streets on a small block, 4th, 5th, Commerce and Calhoun streets with lots of traffic, buses, cars, trucks, whatever. So for the three stories below the ground, we're surrounded by a silicone rubber acoustical barrier, so-called. It's like we're floating in a, a teacup, floating in a saucer sort of thing. We're surrounded by this barrier, and it's the sort of thing they do in California to protect the buildings there from the effects of earthquakes. So that abs absorbs the vibrational uh, noise and, and vibration that we would get from traffic on the four busy streets about us. So for those two very good reasons, once you come into the concert hall, it's very, very quiet. The other reasons is, like in the hallway coming in, we have acoustical fabric on the hall, on the walls. Uh, the fabric comes from Scandinavia. It's in various colors and it's throughout the hall, but it, it absorbs sound. And then like that hallway that we just came through has triple doors, so it's for sound light control it keeps noise and flashes of light and that sort of thing out of the, of the hall. Very important for the ballet because you don't want the dancers to fall. Very important for the opera because the singers don't want to have anything interrupt the flow of their voices. I mentioned we have in excess of 2,000 seats. Uh, we also, you notice we have six seating levels. Uh, we're in the, standing in the orchestra level right here. The parterre circle behind us. Then box tier, mezzanine, lower gallery and upper gallery. Artwork wise, remember we had the east portal with the sunrise sky, the west portal with the afternoon sky, uh -huh. the main hall itself, the Texas noonday sky. The noonday sky with the oculus looking, wants you to have the vision that you're looking through the oculus out into the real world. The dome is about 90 feet above your head and then look at the light fixture in the center of the dome. That was the inspiration for the carving of the marble in the portals. That's your Greek equiangular spiral pattern that we talked about so much earlier. Now, around the dome, around the sky, you'll notice the feathered pattern, again, reminiscent of angel feathers, also reminiscent of the laurel leaf crowns that Apollo would make out of the laurel leaves uh, that he stripped from Daphne's tree, so-called. <laughs> So that ties into the theme of the portal uh, in the east side. Uh, the, the symbolism here is that the audience is being crowned because you're a winner for being at the performance. So there's a symbolism there. Now you'll notice here that the stage is very large. The proscenium arch 
The entranceway to the stage is 58 feet across and 40 feet tall. Guess what? Oddly enough, just about the dimensions of a golden rectangle. Isn't that a surprise? All the golden rectangle we talked about in the portal. But anyway, you have a large arch, <coughs> 58 feet across, 40 feet tall, but the stage itself goes another 28 feet on either side of the arch to the side, and it goes back a total of 58 feet to the back of the wall. They have raised the acoustical curtains that you'll see, these, these uh, acoustical curtains that are around the wall, uh, have been raised to absorb sound as it comes out from, from the performance that's going on the stage. If we had something like a symphony orchestra on the stage, you want a wraparound sound. This is, notice this is a typical European style horseshoe shaped concert hall, typical of the 19th century. The, to have the wraparound sound, the acoustic curtains would be lowered into the wall and then we would be setting up a concert hall shaper. The concert hall shaper is really a unique thing. This is the second one that was built in the world. The first one was installed in 1997 in a concert hall in Tokyo. This is the second one installed. So it's a real a technological breakthrough by Jaffe Holden and Scarborough, who were the acousticians for Bass Hall. Uh, because of the uh, acoustical features of the hall, being assisted by things like the concert hall shaper and the, the uh, uh, acoustical curtains around the wall that are, can be lowered and raised under computer control. Because of the superb acoustics of the hall, this hall is actually rated as one of the top 10 concert halls in the world. And in that position, uniquely, uh, very nice because we are the youngest of the top 10, ranking there with like La Scala in Milan, the Mariinsky in St. Petersburg, the Bolshoi in Moscow, Sydney Opera House in Sydney, Australia, Teatro Massimo in Palermo, Sicily, and some of the other great opera houses of the world. So a very, very good distinction for the Bass Hall, the youngest of the top 10. We should notice here, we've got uh, some very nice upholstery. You might think it was velvet. Uh, it's not really velvet, this is real Texas, folks. This is a mohair from the Texas Hill Country. It's a goat hair, mohair, and it was selected because it has very rich color without fading. It holds the color, and it's very durable. This is the original fabric here in the hall. Uh, it's been here since 1998. It, uh, is still looking really good and that's after having like 200 to 300 performances a year uh, that are for paid audiences plus all the children's performances that come here uh, during the school year. <clears throat> Incidentally, we passed our one millionth child coming through. Uh, these are performances that are free for the children. Uh, Bass Hall provides the venue, the performing arts groups that are either resident here or visiting here provide the talent and the school, independent school districts provide the bus service to bring the kids here. So we have somewhere to eight to 900 children here every Monday through Friday in the mornings for free performances to help them become more acquainted with the performing arts and perhaps become future patrons or maybe future performers. The other thing, we have a lot of angels I mentioned around the hall, angel themes. You'll notice at the ends of the stanchions, we have our, our angel feather motif. Uh, we mentioned that the air conditioning is generated across Calhoun Street. The big air conditioners are located external to the hall. The air is brought through the tunnel under Calhoun Street and brought to the top of this building. And it comes in through the vents that you see all around the top of the hall and flows down through the building at a constant rate and exits through the grids that you see in the floor here. That's your air outflow. The volume of air changes every hour. The volume is, is replenished and, and refreshed every hour and the space that it's being uh, filled is approximately 600,000 square feet of space in the hall itself. Another interesting thing that we see while we're right here, you notice on the stage while we, I've been talking, I've been pointing out the stage and you've had this light shining in your eyes and you think, oh my God, well, won't they turn off that light? We can't turn off the light. That's your ghost light, that's your stage light, part of your theater superstition. You never let the theater go dark, it's bad luck. So keep the light on, 
even though it blinds you, that's all right. You have to have the stage light on. So that's your, that's your stage light, your ghost light. Uh, we're in the box tier, and this is, as you can see, the center box. There are 21 boxes here, plus the two actors' boxes on each end. This is the center box, box K. Our particular configuration here is eight seats in the box, a 3-3-2 three, three, configuration. And since it's a flat floor, you'll notice that the legs of the chairs have the front row has shorter legs, the second row has a little longer legs, the back row has the longer legs. And then decoratively, whereas you saw the silver out in the audience chamber, here we have the gold leaf laid into the columns and the nice lapis stones accenting the gold in the, in the bottom of the, of the columns here all around. So it's really the typical gold uh, decorative features that you'd find in a European style concert hall. Uh, here we are on the box tier level and we're in the two fancy rooms, if you like, for the box tier. Uh, we're standing, this is the Richardson Room, named after the Sid Richardson Foundation gift, the large gift to the hall, the $18 million gift. So this is the Sid, the Richardson Room, and below us we have the Green Room. Uh, immediately behind me is the portrait of Nancy Lee and Perry R. Bass, the, name, uh, the, hall, the names that the, the people the hall was really named for. Nancy Lee and Perry R. Bass, and the, you'll notice that the, it's such a great likeness, you'd almost think it was a photograph that had been enlarged and painted, but it actually is a portrait done by one of the twin brothers, Scott Gentling, the ones that did the, the artwork for the hall itself. Uh, the Richardson Room and Green Room have some really beautiful features about them. The, uh, the floor is an unusual wood. It's mesquite wood, very hard wood, made of mesquite trees. Uh, which are no, notably not something you'd think you'd get lumber from. So you notice the pieces are very short because mesquite trees are very gnarly. So the short pieces of lumber. Uh, the walls are cherry wood wall. The doors are solid cherry wood. Then if you'll notice the light fixtures themselves, the sconces and then the four chandeliers, the one here in the Richardson room, the three in the green room. Uh, these are Sabino glass. They are contemporary with Lalique and Tiffany, but they're Sabino glass, they come from France. And they were acquired by Mrs. Bass many, many years ago. And when the hall was being uh, built, she offered them to the hall if they had a place where they would like to exhibit them. And they said, yes, they would like to put them in the green room and Richardson room. And this is where, where they reside. Uh, you'll notice how much they look like feathers. You'll notice how much they might inspire you to think of angels and the music of the spheres and these would be the oldest uh, items that we would have in the hall that really would present that angel motif so they could very well have been the catalyst for the big angel icons that we see on the on the north facade of the hall itself uh, the furniture the chairs are unique they come from michigan from the cranbrook institute in bloomfield hills michigan and the designers are uh, the sons and nephews of the uh, famous Eero Serenin, who was the designer of the Gateway to the West Arch in the city of St. Louis, Missouri. And we do cater to wedding receptions, birthdays, anniversaries, all sorts of things, classes, uh, master's classes uh, for college uh, students, uh, corporate meetings, all sorts of things. So these rooms are multi-purpose rooms, but of course used by the the various uh, symphony leagues, opera guilds, and so forth for entertainment between, uh, pr during uh, uh, performances, during the intermissions, and before and after performances. So they get a lot of utilization. Very, very beautiful, very, very functional use for lots of various things around the hall. Uh, we're here in the mezzanine lobby area right now of the, of the Bass Hall. And uh, in addition to the fact that this is a very beautiful uh, English baronial style uh, lobby itself, you'll notice it has a lot of glass looking out to the north over the Sundance Square area. This is where David Schwartz wanted to have an expansive look to the hall. Remember we're confined to that one acre block, but here you look out and it looks like you're just a huge area that, and you're looking at all of Sundance Square. And then out on our balcony here we have the two big Texas Cordova Cream limestone angels that were sculpted by a gentleman named Martin Varro. Uh, the angels are made in pieces. Each one has, 
consists of 52 blocks of Cordova Cream Limestone that was mined down near Austin, uh, near the Marble Falls area. And he sculpted the angels by hand with hammer and chisel. It took him three years. And he actually did the work in Irvine, California. So the blocks of limestone were shipped to Irvine, California. He did the sculpting there, and then the blocks were shipped back. And he supervised the installation of the angels on the north facade from a table across the street at what was then Angeluna's restaurant with a megaphone. Anyway, the angels are 48 feet tall. Their trumpets are 13 feet long. They're brass covered with a gold leaf, just like the columns inside the audience chamber itself are covered with gold leaf, 22 carat. And uh, they are the symbol of the Bass Hall. The angels are the recognizable symbol of the Bass Performance Hall. The other, the other thing we might mention while we're here on the mezzanine lobby are the uh, basically a history book of the hall. Everything from the Sid Richardson $18 million donation to Mrs. Butler's third grade elementary school class that gave $10.33. They're all listed here. It also has uh, the names of all the people that actually worked on the hall, all the construction people. Oh, there were over a thousand people that actually did physical labor on the hall. They're all listed here. And then last but not least, all the volunteers that have worked in the hall over the years. Of course, we're in the Grand Salon area now, and we happen to be in the ladies' room, which you'll notice is quite spacious. And uh, it was uh, the size of the ladies' room is dictated by the state of Texas, the laws. We have the law of the state of Texas, affectionately called the Potty Parity Law, where they do a study for a new building that's being uh, constructed and that determines the number of restroom facilities that have to be supplied for the mix of the audiences that are going to be attending performances in that building. So as a result, normally the ladies' rooms are much larger than the men's room. This one, being in a performance hall, you'll notice that we have the, uh, uh, the nice decorative features at the top, which you may recognize as, a, as musical notes. We'll have a quiz on those in a little bit. But we have the uh, decorative features at the top and then on the doors themselves. Again, more musical uh, 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 symbolism. Uh, like a bank of stalls will start with a, in this case, a treble cleft uh, at the first and end with a DS alpine here on the final one. And that's true for all the, the uh, stalls in here. The marble is a very nice Italian marble. Uh, the men's rooms are smaller than this one and feature a Mexican marble as opposed to an Italian marble. This is the Italian. Uh, the music notes you may uh, recognize they are from Antonin Dvorak's Symphony Number no. Nine, from the New World. It's the Largo movement, the second movement, and the popular song that's being sung here. You could hum along to it. is called "Going Home," which you may have heard the melody. And the men's room, when you look in there, it will have the matching notes only in the bass clef, whereas these are treble clef notes. Here in the Grand Salon, you'll notice that we have several very very nice posters along the walls here. Immediately behind me, uh, you'll see three uh, great uh, examples. These are posters, they're the real thing, from the 1920s and the 1930s, advertising performances that were being uh, on the stage at that time in, in the great cities of Europe, like uh, Amsterdam and Paris and London, Rome. And uh, these posters came to us from Texas Christian University, from Ed Landreth Auditorium at Texas Christian University in 2001 when the Van Cliburn International Piano Competition moved for the first time from Ed Landreth to Bass Hall. They wanted the posters which had decorated Ed Landreth to go with the competition to Bass Hall. They were provided by the Rowan Foundation and Mrs. Elton Hyder and they're, like I say, they're, they are the originals. Now, if you go to Ed Landreth Hall, you will see copies of these posters. There were copies made, and they still exist at Ed Landreth, but these are the originals that they felt should go with a Clyburn competition when it came here to Bass Hall, like I say, for the first time in the year 2001.
I hope you have enjoyed this tour of the Nancy Lee and Perry R. Bass Performance Hall and that you will come back at an early opportunity to see one of the fine performances that are featured here throughout the year. It's truly a magical place, a beautiful mix of art, architecture, and performance quality. So come again soon.